In this video, we continue to advance our understanding of NMR spectroscopy by focusing on something that is called the Larmor frequency. All right, in a prior video, we have seen what the resonance condition is for NMR spectroscopy. The energy of the photon has to be identical to the energy separation between two nuclear spin states. And for atoms like, uh, for nuclei like the proton, this is given by an expression which looks like this. This is equal to the uh, magnetogenic ratio. This is uh, Planck's constant, 2 pi, and there is external magnetic field. All right, so uh, we can carry out like a simple calculation to see where those energies fall. And then uh, if we use here um, an external magnetic field uh, of about 14.1 Tesla, which is a, a typical uh, value for an external magnetic field in a modern uh, NMR spectrometer, and then we use here the uh, magnetogenic ratio or geomagnetic ratio for proton. Then we get a number here that is equal to uh, 3.98, 10 to the minus 25 joules. Right, so again, those, those uh, energy gaps are in the order of 10 to the minus 25, 10 to the minus 26 joules or so. And again, th those, uh, that energy gap is about a million times more or less uh, weaker than what you have for UVs. And that means that uh, you actually are doing, uh, you're using radio frequency photons to carry out this spectroscopy. Now, uh, something that would be interesting then to calculate is uh, what is the vibrational frequency that you actually, uh, not the vibrational frequency, but the vibration, uh, uh, the frequency of the photon that you need to shine in order to be able to carry this, spe this spectroscopy. Okay, so uh, removing this, uh, or canceling out those uh, Planck's constants, you have that the uh, frequency uh, that you need to shine is equal to gamma B0 over 2 pi. Okay, and when you actually carry out that calculation for this particular system, so same external magnetic field, same uh, uh, proton, same nucleus, okay, this happens to be 600 10 to the 6 hertz. Okay, or in other words, this is equal to 600 megahertz. Okay, so uh, this is the uh, uh, frequency of the photon that you need to shine on that uh, proton uh, in order to be able to uh, excite the nuclear spin transition. Okay, but at the same time it turns out that this is also called the Larmor frequency. Okay, because that that is also the frequency of the precession of this uh, uh, spinning motion around the external magnetic field. Okay, so again, a, a way to understand how uh, this spinning motion, this nuclear spin motion takes place, is that if you have here uh, the external magnetic field, okay, uh, the nucleus kind of wobbles, okay, this way, so that the uh, uh, induced uh, magnetic field is either pointing up or pointing down. Okay, those are kind of the two motions. But it's called a precession. Okay, so it turns out that in order to satisfy the resonance, resonance condition, okay, uh, the frequency of this precession around that axis okay, has to be identical to the frequency of the uh, photon that you're shining uh, in order to accept that transition. Okay, when you, whenever you satisfy the resonance condition, then uh, uh, you can excite uh, the transition and be able to obtain a peak in your spectrum. Okay, so that, that frequency of precession is called the Larmor frequency. Okay, and it's pretty common that uh, uh, modern spectrometers are actually uh, uh, separated by not the external magnetic field, which will be in this case 14.1 Tesla, but instead uh, they're usually uh, uh, talked about in terms of the uh, frequency, uh, the Larmor frequency of a bare proton. Okay, so we have 600 megahertz spectrometers or 300 megahertz spectrometers or 800 megahertz spectrometers. All of those correspond to a different magnetic field. Okay, but again, it's, it's a little easier to just use this uh, uh, nominal frequency of the spectrometer, which comes from that expression, and it's just simply the Larmor frequency. Okay? Right now, uh, it seems important uh, that you recognize that uh, the strength of the magnetic field is actually uh, uh, important to uh, where the peaks will appear. Notice that if you actually have uh, a large uh, external magnetic field, then what will happen is that the energy states will be much more separated then you actually have a small magnetic field. Uh, right, so this can actually be uh, uh, shown uh, with this graph where we're going to be increasing here the strength of the magnetic field in this direction. Okay, and here we're just going to have uh, uh, 
the energy separation between the alpha and beta stems, okay, which is exactly this expression. Okay? If we actually have a serial magnetic field, so that means that there's no external magnetic field, okay, the two spin states okay, are going to be degenerate. Okay, so that is going to be your alpha and your beta spin. Okay, but as you turn on the external magnetic field, okay, they start to separate the energy. Okay, so uh, the alpha spin becomes increasingly uh, more stable, the beta spin becomes increasingly less stable. And again, depending on where you are, if this, if this happens to be 7 Tesla, this might be 14 Tesla, maybe 21 Tesla, notice that what happens is that you actually have different separation in energy between those states. Okay? So that at low fields, or lower axial magnetic fields, the gap in energy is smaller than when you actually have larger fields. Okay, that will be the gap, the gap, and the gap for the various uh, magnetic fields. Now, uh, the external magnetic field uh, is also going to be important in uh, talking about the intensity of the signals. Okay, what we actually know is that uh, the intensity of the signals is related to the difference in population between the alpha and the beta spins to, uh, spins to start with. Okay, uh, we have studied for other spectroscopies, and the way to do this is by uh, to see how many uh, spins or uh, how many systems you have in the ground versus the excited uh, energy state would be to do the following. Okay, so uh, we can calculate here the ratio between spins in the alpha state versus spins in the beta st uh, uh, state. Okay, using uh, this Boltzmann uh, energy expression, so the difference in energy between the alpha and the beta spin over Boltzmann constant times the temperature. Okay, so using the energy that we just had for this example, this 3.98. 10 to the minus uh, 26 joules, and uh, doing this at 300 Kelvin, what we actually have here is that uh, the ratio of populations between uh, a nuclei that are uh, in the low energy state, alpha spin, and the nuclei that are in the higher energy state, beta spin, is actually a number very, very close to 1, 2, 3, 4, if we assume that all of the uh, digits are significant. Okay. So that is actually uh, the number that we get. This makes a huge difference with what we had with uh, UVBs and infrared spectroscopy. In UV spectroscopy, when we calculate these numbers for the uh, low uh, energy state to the high energy state, okay, these energies were on the order of 10 to the minus uh, 19 joules or so. And this number that we got here was very, very close to zero, which means that virtually uh, every single system is in the ground state. Okay, for vibrational spectroscopy, the energy that we have right here is about 10 to the minus 20 or so, and then uh, uh, the excess of population that we had between the excited state and the ground state typically was maybe one system in the excited state for every 100,000 systems in the ground state, or maybe one to a million still, the population was extremely biased towards the ground state. However, in this case, in NMR spectroscopy, because the energy gap between these states is actually so, so tiny, okay, uh, it turns out that uh, the uh, bias of population to, to, towards the ground state is very, very small. This number actually is the same thing as saying that for every 100,000 items that you have uh, in the excited state, there's only one more that you have in the ground state. Okay, so again, notice that there's almost exactly the same number of systems in the ground state uh, that in the excited state, the excess of population in the ground state is just a little bit, one in every 100,000, for this type of, of uh, change uh, in energy, okay? Now, so, so it turns out that uh, the sensitivity, the intensity of your signal is proportional to this gap, right? You like to have as much excess in the ground state as you, as, you, as you possibly can, right? So naturally, a way to actually increase this is to uh, separate more and more the gap between these two states, right? The larger you make this number, Okay, the more different, uh, the smaller this number is going to be, and that means that the number of uh, the bias of population in the ground state versus the excited state is going to be greater. Right, so this is one of the advantages of using a huge magnetic field versus a small magnetic field. Okay, but when you use very large magnetic fields, you're increasing the gap between the alpha and beta state, and that biases the population more towards the ground state, which means that the intensity of your signals uh, is going to be ever increasing. Okay, so. Uh, uh, this kind of finishes our discussion of the Larmor frequency and some practical considerations for uh, NMR spectroscopy before we get started with actually how the spectra look like and uh, details like the chemical shift, spin-spin coupling, and things like that.